We're going to move on to Gauss's law, which is a real, which lets us calculate a number of really cool problems without doing a lot of math. All right, we are going to start by defining the flux of the electric field through a surface. Um, now, you've already seen flux, or you, you already, if you want to think about what flux means, um, you can think about water traveling through a pipe, that uh, the, the flux would be the amount of flow of water through the pipe through some area. So if you want to calculate the total amount of water through an, a hole uh, through a pipe, you would look at uh, the flow of water um, relative to the area. We're doing something similar for the electric field. Um, we're going to take some arbitrary surface, and there is some, it's in some electric field, and we want to know how much of, we want some measurement of how much electric field goes through that surface. So, what we're going to do is define a, uh, well, the, these arrows E are the electric field vectors. And then we need to uh, define a vector which is perpendicular to the surface. And we call this n hat. Now, you have an arbitrary choice of n hat. It could go this way or that way. So the flux is then defined up to a sign um, because you get to choose whether it's pointing outward or inward um, or left or right, depending on, you know, it's, it's an arbitrary choice. So the flux is defined up to a sign. Um, the things that we're going to focus on, we, it, it doesn't actually matter, we're going to define, uh, we're going to define it as a closed, look only at closed surfaces, and then we define n hat to be outwards. So that defines our, that defines our um, direction convention. Now, if you then have an electric field that were, say, parallel to the surface, you would have no flux because there is nothing going through the surface. That's like, if you have water flowing through a pipe and you ask how much water is going this way and your water is flowing this way, uh, you don't have any water flowing this way. Okay. Then, if we have a simple case where, uh, where your surface is flat um, or where the um, electric field, the angle... Act, where the angle of the electric field, really it's, it's the angle of the electric field with the normal vector to the surface is constant, then you do not have to do an integral. And the electric flux is the electric, the dot product of the electric field with the normal vector times the area of the surface. So for instance, you have a constant electric field and your normal vector is constant, you don't have to do any integral. If you are dealing with some arbitrary shape, some weird, um, some weird surface, you know, take this this rag, and it's not straight. The flux you're gonna to get the flux, you're gonna have to look at the um, you're gonna have to integrate over it, and at each point in principle, then you are looking at the normal vector at that point and the amount of electric field through that point. And you have to integrate over the whole surface. So this is a dA. What that dA translates to depends on your coordinate system. But in Cartesian coordinate systems, this dA is just dx dy. Um, in spherical polar coordinates, well, sorry, in polar coordinates, it is r dr d theta. And in spherical polar coordinates, it is r squared sine phi d phi d theta dr. So, uh, sorry, area, not surface. In spherical polar, I don't have the r. I have r, d, r sine theta d 
R sine phi d phi d theta. So it depends on which coordinate system you use. There will be a few times when it is convenient to, um, to look at, um, well, actually, the area also depends on what type of surface you have. There will be times when it is convenient to use spherical polar or cylindrical coordinates or something other than Cartesian. If you have not taken Calc 3 yet, this is going to be, there's going to be some tricky aspects to this. As usual, so my class is, uh, it takes calculus concurrently. I'm going to do the integrals with, for you. And if you are struggling with it because you haven't had calculus, that's okay. But I like to show you at least how to do it. Um, if you're continuing on in physics, I would recommend that you come back and review this before you get to your higher level class. All right, so here you have an electric field, and this, as drawn, is a constant electric field. And if you want to calculate the electric flux through a certain shape, um, so the electric flux is, you can think of it as counting the number of electric field lines, or it is a measure of is a measure of how much electric field goes through there. So if the electric field is larger, you have a larger electric flux. If you have, um, if the surface area is larger, you have a larger electric flux. So if we have, let's say we have a square in a constant electric field. Uh, so I'm going to draw this and try to draw it in some perspective. And this is our electric field. And we will say, let me draw a coordinate system. This is So now my electric field, or sorry, my surface is in the XZ plane, and I will make my, this is not the best drawing, let us say that our electric field, that looks sort of like it is some constant, and it make, looks like it makes a 45 degree angle with the um, x-axis. So we will say that that is 1 over, over the square root of 2, x-hat, and then it is in the negative y-hat direction. We'll put a square root of 2 there. So if this is our electric field, now the um, now we have a choice for the normal vector. Let's write out what that normal vector is. Um, let's choose the normal vector is just y hat. So our, uh, our normal vector, we are choosing to be in this direction. So it is perpendicular to the surface. It has to be perpendicular to the surface that we are integrating over. Our electric field is constant. Our normal vector is constant. We don't need to do the integral. So, um, but we do need to calculate the area. And we will say that this is a square with sides of length. Let's not call it A, because that sounds too much like area. We'll call it a square of, with sides of length L. All right. So, our flux is the dot product of the electric field with the normal vector times the area. So, that the electric dot product of the electric field with the normal vector is negative E naught over the square root of 2 because I when I take the dot product of y hat with x hat, that is 0. 
I take the dot product of y hat with y hat, that is 1. So I get a negative 1 over the square root of 2 times e naught. And then I have to multiply by the area. My area is L squared. So that is my flux through that particular um, surface. When it went, so that's when everything is nice and neat and constant. Now, this is not a, a I am not teaching a calculus-based class, so there are a few examples that I have students do in class because many of students in my class have had calculus where I want you to at least see it, but you have a fellow student to help you with the integrals. Um, and otherwise, I'm not going to assign you, if you don't have to know calculus for this class, I'm not going to assign you problems where you have to use calculus. There are a few where you might, I might ask you to set the integrals up, because if you were taking Calc 2 now, you should be able to set up integrals. All right, a planar surface of area A is perpendicular to an electric field E. The N, there are N lines that cross the surface. So here, um, if, you, if you had this, you would have to, to calculate the full flux, you would need to know what that area is. Um, here, you have a surface area of S2. So now here, this is not perpendicular. So here, the field lines are perpendicular to the surface. So your electric flux is the magnitude of the electric field times the surface area of the surface. Here, your electric field makes an angle with respect to the surface. So, um, and in fact, you're told that that angle is theta. So you have the, um, so your flux is equal to E dot N hat times the area. So now the, um, now your E dot N hat is going to equal the angle is theta, so you have E naught, the magnitude of the electric field, and then cosine theta, and then times the area. So in the second case, in the first case, your uh, electric field is the, your electric flux is the electric field times the area. In the second case, it's the electric field times the cosine of the angle between the surface and the, um, and the normal vector times the area. All right, and this shows that you have this arbitrary choice um, that changes the sign. When we have a closed surface, we choose, by convention, we choose the normal vector to point outwards from the surface. Every other time, there is an arbitrary sign. All right, so here you can see a few different surfaces. So the, um, you're up, depending on where you are, if you are, um, if you are on a flat surface, the only choices you have are in or out. If you have uh, some 3D surface, then your normal vector is going to change depending on where you are on the surface. Okay, so now if you calculate the flux um, through a cube, so here you have um, one of those parallel plate capacitors that we talked about. So you have two charged planes, and you're ca because you have two charged planes, the electric field between the two charged planes is roughly constant. And if we want to calculate the flux through this cube, we actually have to have that we have to calculate the flux through all six surfaces of the cube. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and four of the surfaces, so I'm going to draw a couple pictures that make this easier. So now we have, this is looking down on the cube, and we have This is my attempt to draw what, you know, I'm drawing the electric field. The electric field is constant everywhere. 
and we're looking down on the cube, so we see the tip of the arrow. Um, our electric field is a constant E, and let us calculate the flux. Let's first do the top, and this is a side, this, we will give this cube sides length L. So on the top, uh, our, so by convention, our normal vector has to point outward from the surface. On the top, our normal vector is up. It is in the same direction as the electric field. And it is parallel to the electric field because the electric field for two parallel plates always points from the lower plate to the upper plate. Um, and you know, if we wanted to, we could draw our z-axis here, and then this is our x-y plane. OK, so for the top surface, the flux is our electric field times the area because there's no angle between the um, between the electric field and the normal vector. For the bottom surface, the normal vector points down because the normal vector, by convention, has to point outward from the closed surface from the closed container. So, then. That means that our normal vector is going to be anti-parallel to the electric field. So when we take the dot product of the electric field with the normal vector, we get a negative E. And then we multiply times the area of that surface. Then we have four surfaces which are uh, the um, which are the sides of the cube. And if we look, wherever we look, whichever side we look down on, so the normal vector is always going to be pointing. So here, let me draw, choose a different color, and I'll draw the normal vector for each of the sides. The normal vector is always perpendicular from the, to the surface and pointing outward from the container. So for this side, the normal vector is perpendicular to the electric field. For this side, the normal vector is perpendicular to the electric field. For this side, the normal vector is perpendicular to the electric field. And for this side, the normal vector is perpendicular to the electric field. So for all of our sides, the electric flux is zero because the normal vector is always perpendicular to the electric field. And we have four of these sides, but four times zero is still zero. So our total electric flux is this electric flux plus that electric flux, which is equal to zero. So our net electric flux through this cube is in fact zero. We'll talk about why that happens and, and when we get to Gauss's law. Okay, so if you need to integrate, then what you do is that you divide the surface into little patches of area. And what you're going to have to do is figure out an expression for what those patches of area are. So, and it is, whatever it is, you look at some little patch and you define the area the a and there you have some normal vector and you know what and you have some usually some functional form for the value of the electric field everywhere and you're going to calculate that for an arbit arbitrary point and then you have to integrate over the area it can get rather messy all right this is calculating the flux of the, through an, a rectangular surface we've already done a couple of examples like that i would remind you here you are seeing the mirror image of what the of the slides. Um, it's mirroring what I'm saying. So be careful because your uh, coordinate systems, these are right-handed in my perspective, but you will see them as left-handed. All right, and we did just calculate the electric flux through a closed cubic surface. 
Here we have an electric flux which makes a constant 30 degree angle with the normal vector. So here our electric flux is always the dot product of the electric field with the normal vector times the area. So in this case, this would be the magnitude of the electric field times the cosine of the angle between the normal vector and the electric field times the area. So the electric flux is at its greatest when the electric field is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, and when the surf electric field is not constant over a surface, you have to do some type of integration in order to determine the flux. So here, in this case, we are given uh, the, the electric field is equal to C y squared times z hat. And then the normal vector is equal to z hat. And there's a few different ways that we could do this. Um, we now can say e dot n hat is equal to cy squared. All right, that tells us the first part. What we need is to integrate over this. So we have e, so we need to integrate over this over all area, cy squared dA. Now, the way this is setting this up, because for a fixed y value, you have a constant electric field, so you can integrate over the area in strips and say that your dA is the length of the strip times the length in y. And then you would integrate this. You would have C, B, C, y squared dy, and you integrate y from 0 to a, because the, this edge runs from y equals 0 to y equals a. When you do that, you get a, b, c, y is so a cubed. Let me write that a little bit bigger so that it is legible. a cubed b, c, divided by 3. Let's set this up a different way. I am instead going to try d, a equals d, x, d, y, and then I have a double integral. The flux is equal to c y squared d x d y. Now my x integration limits are from 0 to b. And my y integration limits are from 0 to a. Now, when I do the first integral over dx, the integrand does not depend on x. So I simply get x, so the integral from 0 to b gives me an, a factor of b. So I have b c y squared dy integrated from a to b. Now this is exactly what I had here, so I still get the same answer, a cubed b c over 3. So either way I set it up, I get the same answer. That's reassuring. You should get it up, get the same answer however you set it up. Um, I personally find it easier to do double and triple integrals if need be than to sometimes figure out some weird trick to get it to be a one-dimensional, to, to be a single integral. 
I'd rather do double integrals than work really hard at setting it up. It's your choice. Um, if you, uh, there is no one right way. They both should give you the same answer, assuming that you do not make any algebra mistakes. Algebra mistakes are probably the number one type of mistakes that students make in introductory physics classes. A good cross check against making algebra mistakes is to work with a study group. I've always very strongly encouraged my students to get a strong study group and to, uh, you want to rely on the study group. That's great. You each do the problem. If you agree, the odds are much lower. If you do the problem independently and you get the same answer, the odds are much lower that your answer is wrong. It's not impossible. You can still make mistakes, but it's a lot harder. All right. Now you have a closed spherical surface surrounding a point charge, Q. This is a lovely one. This is going to come up when we, come, when we get to Gauss's law. And in fact, we can even go ahead and do it. So we are going to use, actually, I'm going to use the orange marker because that one is nice. It shows up very well. We write down our definition of the electric flux. Whenever I'm doing a problem in physics, I like to start by writing down the definition that I'm using. It keeps me, it reduces the number of stupid mistakes that I'm going to make. All right, so now we have the electric field dotted with the normal vector. <coughs> and then we take the integral over the area. So in this case, our electric field is going to be K Q over R squared. And now this is an R hat. I'm going to use spherical polar coordinates. So I use R hat. I am putting the origin of, the, of this. I'm putting the charge at the origin. So that defines my coordinate system. Um, and now, my normal vector, remember that my normal vector always has to point outward from the surface. So, my normal vector is also r hat. So then, when I take e dot r hat, this is easy. That is simply k q over r squared. And now I, can, I want to know the um, a segment of the surface. In spherical polar coordinates, this is r squared sine phi v phi v theta. Now, Physics and math books tend to use slightly different definitions, uh, well, tend to switch the definitions of phi and theta. So just be aware of this. Actually, let me go ahead and draw it on our coordinate system. Let me choose a nice, big, differently colored marker. So I have some vector here. Let's make the, so for an arbitrary vector, I take the projection of that vector into the xy plane, and I have this vector. The angle theta is the angle of that vector with respect to the x-axis. The angle phi is the angle that the, the vector makes with the z-axis. And we have a choice, you know, do you integrate, which one do you integrate over to pi? We choose to integrate uh, the theta over 2 pi. So we get, take theta from 0 to 2 pi, and we're integrating over that xy plane. Phi, then there's only 180 degrees worth of phi, because your vector can have, a, can make, it, it gets swept out this way all the way down to upside down. So there's an option of zero to pi. And if my vector, so if my vector phi, if, if my vector is over here, I still have a phi of zero to 180 degrees. 
I can't go over 180 degrees. And remember, most math books use the exact opposite definition. So if you're coming from a math class, just, just look real carefully and make sure you're using a consistent definition. And I would also say, there's a, you should, you're probably going to use um, the references in the back of a book or look at uh, things like integral tables. Always double check the definition of those variables because a number of physics books tend to use this definition and math books tend to use the opposite, they tend to have them switched. But I'm sure that you can find examples of textbooks where the um, a physics textbook which has, which has this switched from this and a math textbook which uses this definition. Just check real carefully so that you're sure that you know what, uh, what definition your reference uses. All right, now we're going to set up our integral, and this, is a, and this is easier to set up as a double integral. At least I find it easier to set up as a double integral. We have kq over r squared times r squared sine phi d phi d theta. The phi variable goes from 0 to pi. And the theta variable goes from 0 to 2 pi. All right. We got some nice cancellations here. My R's cancel out. That's awesome. So I'm going to pull out the constants. I have K, Q. Now my integral, now I can actually write this, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta times the integral from 0 to pi of sine phi d phi. This guy just gives me 2 pi. This, I have to do, so here the integral of sine is cosine. So I have the cosine of phi evaluated from 0 to pi. So I have cosine of phi, let's see, ah. I need a negative sign here because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I have negative cosine of phi. So I have here the negative cosine of pi minus the negative cosine of 0. This is equal to 1, and this is equal to 1, so I get 2. So I get, I'm going to put in now, k is actually equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And now I multiply by the charge Q times 4 pi. So this integral is equal to Q over epsilon naught. And this is actually a special case of Gauss's law. So here, and I have done the full 2D integral in spherical polar coordinates. And I get that the total flux is just the charge divided by the permittivity of free space. Looks nice and neat, doesn't it? That's because it is. So how you set these problems up, usually in, um, well, in anything that we're going to do in this class, if you have to set, you, you may have to set a few integrals up, um, but I'm not going to, in an in intro class, I'm not going to test how well, you can do really ugly integrals, but hopefully you can at least set it up. Then you draw the small, a small patch of area. You figure out what your normal vector is um, to the surface. The only ones we're going to consider are going to be cases where it's really pretty straightforward to figure out what that 
normal vector is, and then you integrate. You have to set the integral limits carefully because you have to integrate over the entire surface. Um, and that can take a little bit of time to set up the, the integral. Sometimes there's tricks so that if you, are, if you would rather do a single integral, you can choose your integration, choose your area carefully, and then, um, then it's easier to set up the integral, but only if you choose the, um, only if you choose the area correctly, or you can just go ahead and do a, a double integral. Let's see. Okay, so then here we have the, the flux through different radii. Now note when I did that problem, I just I didn't say what radius we were integrating over. I just so it turned out to be that you, no matter what radius you integrate over, you get the same answer. And what's happening is, of course, your field lines are large. Your field is larger when you're closer to the the charge, but you have a smaller surface area. You go out, your field lines are smaller, but you have a larger surface area. And it turns out that the flux is the same either way. All right, so here, the, so, okay, so then you get, so this result that we got specifically for a sphere around, drawn around a charge happens to be general. So the flux around some closed surface is equal to the magnitude of the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space. So if you have a case here, here you have a charge Q, and then you're looking at the flux through some funny surface out here, but the surface does not enclose any charges, then the net flux has to be zero. The same number of field lines go in as go out. Um, if you are drawing, if you are um, working with a field map where the, draw, the um, number of field lines is proportional to the field, you can just count lines. Here, you have a dipole, which means that you have a positive charge here and a negative charge here. And then if you draw a closed surface around that dipole, the net electric flux has to be zero because you have the net charge that you have enclosed is zero. What that means is that every time you have a field line leave the surface, you have to have another field line enter the surface. So there is no net flux. And changing the size and the shape of the surfaces that enclose a charge doesn't matter as long as the charge is still enclosed. This is called Gauss's law. And this is very useful. And one of the reasons this is very useful is because you can actually calculate the electric field from a, a arbitrary configurations simply knowing that uh, knowing that there's some symmetry. You can calculate the um, electric field of a number of different problems simply by knowing that the electric flux is equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. And there are a number of cases where what we're, where we will have an electric field which is constant over the surface. So our electric flux is just the magnitude of the electric field times the area. So if you have a constant electric flux and you can calculate the area geometrically, or if you have a constant electric field and you can calculate the area geometrically, you can calculate the electric field. This, is an, this gives rise to a number of very fun and clever different problems that we're going to approach. And this was originally developed by Friedrich Gauss. This, I probably should have deleted this picture because it comes up really funny. 
um, when black and white are reversed. All right, so the electric flux through any closed surface surrounding a point charge is given by Gauss's law. So if the charge is positive, all of the field lines point out. If the charge is negative, all of the field lines point in. In this case, so here if we draw a couple of, the, of normal vectors, the normal vector is always going to be um, perpendicular to the surface, and you can even see by eye that normal vector is generally um, is more likely to be aligned with the electric field. Here, these normal vectors are mostly anti-parallel. They're mostly uh, so mostly E times e, the dot product of the electric field with the normal vector is going to be is going to give you a negative number. And then you can look here. So here you have an arbitrary configuration of charges. What I can tell you, this one I can't use to calculate the uh, to calculate an electric field because it's an odd shape. However, I can tell you that the net electric flux is the magnitude of Q1 minus the magnitude of Q2 because Q2 is negative minus the magnitude of Q5 because Q5 is negative all divided by epsilon naught. The magnitude of the flux does not depend at all on any of the other charges. It only depends on charges 1, 2, and 5, because those are the only three charges which are enclosed in the surface. Here, I have different surfaces. So here, I have positive 2 microcoulombs. Let me just keep up our Gauss's law. Here, I have positive 2 microcoulombs enclosed, so my net electric flux is 2 microcoulombs divided by the permittivity of free space. Negative 2 microcoulombs divided by the, pot, the permittivity of free space. Positive 2 microcoulombs divided by the permittivity of free space. These two charges don't contribute at all because they are not enclosed in the surface. Here, I have... 6 minus 4 minus 1 equals 1 microcoulomb enclosed. So my net flux is 1 microcoulomb divided by the permittivity of free space. Here I have 4 plus 6 minus 10 equals 0 coulombs enclosed in the surface. So my net electric flux is 0. And here you can see, you know, various different uh, charge distributions. The flux through this is 3 microcoulombs divided by the permittivity of free space, negative 3 microcoulombs divided by the permittivity of free space, positive 3 coulombs divided by the permittivity of free space, and 0 because there is no charge in that box. All right. So we can do a large class of problems that are spherically symmetric. Um, so let's start by defining what spherically symmetric means. What that means is that when, wherever you look, um, it, wherever you look it out, if you say put the origin here at the center of the sphere, wherever you look, it all looks the same. So here, if you have an isotropic sphere, so you've got some charge distributed isotropically, so it's a, the, a constant density through here, through the sphere. Everywhere you look, it looks the same. You can't tell um, which direction you're pointing in. This is not spherically symmetric because if you look up, it looks different from if you look down. And if you look at this angle, it doesn't look quite the same as if you look at that angle or this angle or that angle. They all look different. This is another example of something which is spherically symmetric where you might have some radial dependence on the distribution of charge, but the radial dependence is the same everywhere you look. So again, you can't tell if you're here, if you're looking in this direction or that direction or this direction or that direction. It all looks the same whatever direction you look in, uh, but there is some radial dependence on that density. 
So when you have a spherically symmetric distribution of charges, then um, you can, uh, the integral is, is the same uh, no matter what. So your, uh, your electric field, the, the normal vector, uh, you draw a surface, which is a sphere, and the normal vector is always r hat. So our, we will use our normal vector to do r hat. And then um, when you have a spherically symmetric, uh, a spherically symmetric problem, your electric field can have some radial dependence, but it does not have an angular dependence. So, uh, and that is, so the electric field is always going to be um, some function of the radius which could mean that it's a constant, times, uh, let me actually re write this a little differently, the electric field is going to be some function of the radius, but it is always going to be radial. So it is always going to be in the r hat direction. Huh. Then our electric field dotted with the normal vector is going to be this electric field as a function of the radius. And then when we do our area, um, we are always going to have the flux is equal to the area of, so the in, uh, integral over the area uh, over the sphere. And then this does not have any radial dependence. And for spherically, for a spherical, let me switch colors because that one's not working so hot anymore. For spherical polar coordinates, the area is r squared sine phi d phi d theta. So, our integral here is going to be a double integral. The electric field only has radial dependence. And then we have an r squared sine phi sine, or sine phi d phi d theta. And the limits from over phi are 0 to pi. The limits over theta are 0 to 2 pi. And just like we did when we did the example of, uh, um, of a charge in, in a sphere, we can pull the radial dependence out and we have an integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi and an integral from 0 to pi sine phi, uh, sorry, this is theta, this is sine phi d phi, and this all equals 4 pi. Now, you also could use the, uh, look up what the surface area of a sphere is. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So when we do the integral over something which does not depend on the on phi or theta, so we do the integral over the whole sphere, something that is not changing over the over that particular right fixed radius, we just get the surface area of the sphere, which is four pi r squared. So for spherically symmetric problems, we are always going to have 4 pi r squared times the electric field as a function of the radius. That's going to hold for... That's <clears throat> The only thing that we assumed to get that was that there is only a possible radial dependence in the electric field. 
So the things that can change are the amount of Q enclosed. So what we can do is the first example is consider a point charge enclosed by the uh, point charge at the origin enclosed by a sphere. Note that this does assume that you your spherical symmetry is centered around the origin. So your origin you have to shift your origin so that it is centered uh, around the whatever spherical sim so that the the problem is spherically symmetric about the origin. All right, so now if we have a point charge, Q enclosed, let's call it as Q naught. So we just have a single point charge. That tells us, we can actually use Gauss's law to tell us that the electric field as a function of the distance from that charge is Q naught the magnitude of the electric field is Q naught over four pi epsilon naught R squared. So that has to be, this is self-consistent. Now, we can, um, so this is true for any spherical, um, any spherically symmetric problem. Okay, so as soon as, now there's a few tricks. So if you have a charge density, which is not isotropic, and you have, you're given, for instance, the charge density, you have to figure out how much charge is enclosed in that surface. Um, and that's the tricky part there. You may have to calculate the, you, you will either be given the charge density and you have to calculate the amount of charge enclosed or you will be given the um, amount of charge enclosed and have to calculate the charge density that way. Um, so furthermore, you have to sometimes impose the boundary condition that when you are exactly on the surface of, the, so if you have some change in the density, when you are exactly on the surface, your electric field has to be the same if you are just inside versus just outside. That is to say that your electric field has to be continuous. It cannot be, um, you cannot have any jumps in your electric field. That's not physical. So here, if you have a uniformly charged, uh, I've got the, all right, if you have a uniformly charged, uh, uniformly distributed, um, an isotropic uniformly distributed, uh, blob of charge. A, so now, how much charge is actually enclosed? So we have, in that case, the density is equal to some constant. We've got some constant density. How much charge is enclosed? In a sphere of radius r, so that is going to be the density. Uh, so this is going to be the integral of the density, which could depend on R, times the volume. So in this case, if we go with a constant density, Then we have rho naught, and we're going to stick with spherical polar coordinates. So spherical polar coordinates are a little harder to use when you're getting used to them than, um, than Cartesian coordinates, but a good physicist is a lazy physicist. This problem is a lot harder if you try to calculate it in Cartesian coordinates. If you had to ca calculate it in Cartesian coordinates, you would have to set your integration limits so that you were integrating over difference over the surface of the sphere correctly, even as that's not the natural variable. So a, a unit of volume is R squared sine phi 
d phi d theta d r. And we now have integration limits. Our integration over phi goes from 0 to pi. Our integration over theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And our integration over r goes from 0 to whatever radius we stop at. Now here I'm going to be a little bit lazy. Our integration value is a variable is lowercase r, and I'm going to put our boundary as lowercase r. I could use different integration boundaries and then have and then swap the variables out. If you would rather, I could do r and r prime. I find it a little bit trickier to keep track of. So I am going to simply leave it as r. I am allowed to do it, but the notation gets a little bit confusing the first time you've seen it. So just bear with me. I'm going to tell you it's probably worth dealing with because other physics professors will do this as well. So now we actually can factorize this. To factorize means to write it as a bunch of things that, do, that multiply but do not depend on each other. So here I have an r squared integral, uh, sorry, I have an r dependent integral and I have a theta dependent integral and, oh, I'm running out of space. Let me watch out here. And then I have a phi dependent integral. I need the sine phi d phi. All right. This is equal to 4 pi. And then... This, in particular, now in this case, I had a constant density, but I, if I didn't have a constant density, I would just have so I can swap out this function here, and I would still have to take an integral of r squared dr, and I don't know when I turned that into an r squared, it should be r squared dr. All right, the integral of r squared dr, so I have rho naught, I have 4 pi rho naught. And then r cubed over 3, which, if you know the surface, you also could look up the volume of a sphere. The vol volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now, a Physicists will go through gr to great lengths to not memorize an equation. Or we would rather do a triple integral and rederive it than memorize. But you, you may also look this up. All right, so that is our Q. So now that tells us what our Q enclosed is. And now we use Gauss's law. We have to use Gauss's law to get the electric field. We say this side has to equal that side. So 4 thirds rho naught r cubed over epsilon naught equals 4 pi r squared times the electric field as a function of r. Now, I can cancel a bunch of stuff out here. I got a 4 pi here. I got a 4 pi here. I have r, to, r cubed there, r squared there. And I am left with the electric field for a constant density as a function of r is rho not r over 3 epsilon naught. So now I not only know, now this just shows, well, this is roughly what it is. I can now tell you that the electric field is rho not r over 3 epsilon naught. Now, when I get just to the surface, 
of that um, of that sphere. So I get to rho equals uh, I get to r equals capital R. I now know so the electric field as a function of capital R has to equal rho naught r over 3 epsilon naught. I also know that uh, here I have to have my Q enclosed has to equal at R my Q enclosed has to equal the total Q, the total charge enclosed. So I have Q equals 4 pi rho naught R cubed over 3 or rho naught equals 3 fourths pi q r capital r cubed okay now that tells me that exactly at the boundary of the sphere well let's check exactly at the boundary of the sphere I should also get what I see for a point charge. So the electric field is then 3q over 3 epsilon naught r over 4 pi r cubed or the total charge over 4 pi epsilon naught because I have a lot of cancellation. And I have an R squared here. Okay, so my cancellations are the freeze cancel and one of the R's cancel, so I am left with Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Now, exactly at, so once we get outside of the boundary, my amount of, once we get outside of the sphere containing the charge, the amount, amount of charge does not change. So outside of the sphere, my electric field is, as a function of R, is Q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So, and I've just shown, or sorry, over little, uh, this is now the little dis, r, the distance from the center. So, here I, I can take this and I, well, and this one, I, this is E of r is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. I could rewrite this in terms of q, and I get, if I write this, I'm going to use this result and plug it into here, and I get 3 Q over 4 pi r cubed times r over 3 epsilon naught, and my 3's cancel out again, And I am left with an electric field in terms of the total charge of Q R over 4 pi epsilon naught R cubed.
Okay, and then you can actually see easily that exactly at the boundary, these have the, t the same value. This was for a constant density. I could use some other arbitrary density, and I, my constants might work out a little bit differently. But note that here, when you're outside of the sphere, the charge, it, the electric field, is the, is the charge enclosed divided by 4 pi epsilon r squared. That's going to be true independent of what's going on inside the sphere, because when we ask the question what the electric field is outside of the sphere, you never have any R dependence in the Q square, in the, in the Q enclosed. So you will always get that the electric field outside of the sphere has this form. So outside of the sphere, you are in fact not at all sensitive to the structure of the charge. You're not sensitive to the distribution of the charge. That's actually a really big, cool conclusion. You know, it doesn't, you are not independent of how that charge is distributed. You are not sensitive to the way that it is distributed when you're outside it. All that matters, if, if it's spherically, um, if it's spherically symmetric outside that sphere, it just looks like a point charge. This is really cool because it also tells us that we don't have to, there's a lot of details uh, that we don't actually have to understand. So you don't have to understand, for instance, the structure of a nucleus to understand that it, to, to have the electric field of a nucleus. Otherwise, a lot of problems would really become intractable. And I think this also shows the way that you can, with Gauss's law, you can take something which is which seems at first to be really complicated, and how would you figure out the electric field of an, well, the other way that you could figure out the electric field of an isotropic distribution of charge is to add up the, to calculate the electric, take the fundamental form of a point charge, take the charge density, integrate over it, and you would have to do, you would have to keep track in principle of all of the dimensions, it would get ugly, but note that with Gauss's law, we can turn it almost into a simple algebraic problem. And then you've figured out the electric field for a, what could be a really complicated case. All right. So, yeah, so then what you see, this, is, this shows you what the electric field looks like. So the electric field inside of an isotropic sphere of charge increases constantly, and then as soon as you're outside of it, the electric field drops off with R squared. So inside of the sphere, as you start enclosing more and more of the charge, your electric field starts getting larger and larger as you move outward in the sphere. You hit the surface, and it starts dropping off with 1 over R squared. All right, we can do some of the same tricks for cylinders. So now we're looking for something which is, we're looking at problems which are cylindrically symmetric. When we take a cylinder, we're gonna integrate, so if it is a cylindrically symmetric problem, then, um, well, you have one of two cases. So here's the center of the cylinder, and here's the cylinder. If it is cylindrically symmetric, you can either have a constant electric field going through the cylinder or a, a, an electric field which is always pointing outward. But you can't have both because as soon as you have, um, as soon as you have both, you no longer have that symmetry. Or, but, but you can have you can have a situation where you have the end of a cylinder, and on the end you have an electric field which points out uh, or in, and on the outside you have a, um, on the outside you have a radial symmetry. So you have a radial electric field. All right. So what is cylindrically symmetric? So if you have an isotropic charge, this is cylindrically symmetric. Uh, isotropic inside the cylinder. 
Um, an example of this is if you have, if you model a wire as having um, current, current moving through it um, roughly uniformly distributed, you have, you have a positive charge somewhere on the wire and it's nearly isotropic, that's cylindrically symmetric. If you have something where there's a, some interface and the charge density changes, that is no longer cylindrically symmetric. If you have something where there's different sides of the cylinder, that is no longer cylindrically symmetric. But you can have, just like we had with the sphere, you can have a charge density which changes as a function of, uh, of radius. Okay, so in this cylindrically symmetrical situation, you are going to you you're going to use spherical polar or you're going to use polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, we use r hat again. Um, so we'll fix our this is going to be our x axis, and actually that's going to be our y axis because I want it to be right handed for you. So I'm going to switch these x. Oh, I actually did want to have an X and Y, because that's right-handed for me, and I want it right-handed for you. Not that it matters. It's cylindrically symmetric. So we are going to use R hat, and we're going to use the angle theta, which is the angle relative to the x-axis. And then we use Z. And those are our, so we're going to use R, theta, and Z. Those are our polar coordinates. All right, now we can do, when we, um, if we are looking at the radial dependence of the, um, of, so we have a radially symmetric problem, we must have a radially symmetric field. So our normal vector is always going to be pointing out from the cylinder. So when we do the electric field dotted with the normal vector, they're going to be parallel. So that is going to give us the magnitude of the electric field, which could have some radial dependence. Now, if we, so that gives us the electric field. We're now integrating over the surface of the cylinder, and we're going to use L as the height. Sometimes this L is going to cancel out but I like to make it very explicit what exactly you're integrating over. So if you're integrating over the cylinder, the surface area of the cylinder in this direction is going to be 2 pi r for the, ra the radius times L. So that's the area that we enclose. Now, let's take different cases. Let us assume that, uh, let's look at Let's start with the isotropic case again. So let's assume that you have some charge density, which you have some constant charge density. So let's ask how much charge is enclosed. Q enclosed is going to equal the whatever our density is, the integral of that over the area. So we have Let's assume a constant density. And now the area is going to be 2 pi r. And then we will integrate over z. And let's, let's actually put our origin. Uh, I've drawn this in an incon... Well, well, OK, we'll do it a little. We'll put the origin halfway up the cylinder. So this is at negative L over 2, and this is at L over 2. If I were drawing it again, I would have drawn it so that uh, I would have drawn it so that the um, origin were down here. It's going to make our limits, our integration limits a little uglier. So we're gonna, but we're going to have to integrate over dz from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And then, um, then we need to integrate over theta. So we have d theta goes from 0 
the two, ah, I have, uh, uh, sorry, I have explicit, I have already put in the R dependence. Uh, no, let's see. Theta goes from zero to two pi, and we have a constant, yeah, I am, I am putting in, let's see, our, it's our area, so we, our area segment DA is DZ times R D theta. Sorry about that. Because the arc length is R D theta and the height is DZ. So now, when I do this integral, the integral, so my rho naught is constant, the integral over Z gives me a length L. The integral over R D theta gives me 2 pi r. I could have done this without the integral, and that's where I was getting tripped up. I was doing it half as an integral and half just doing it geometrically. I know that the surface area of a sphere, or sorry, the surface area of a cylinder is going to be 2 pi r times L. So this gives me the Q enclosed. Um, and for I can even write that is in terms, I can then write rho naught in terms of the Q enclosed. It has to be Q, the Q enclosed divided by 2 pi R L. Now, if I am, uh, so sorry, 2 pi R, if I'm, that's the, the radius of the wire. This should be a capital R, 2 pi r. So the, the rho naught is Q enclosed over 2 pi capital RL, where capital R is the, um, is the total radius that has charge in it. And I can then write the, um, so then my Q enclosed, So this should not be Q enclosed, this should be Q total. My Q, this is my Q. My Q enclosed, when I am not quite at the edge of the cylinder, is going to be rho naught times L times 2 pi R. In other words, the enclosed charge is Q little r over big R. Now, inside the cylinder, so inside the cylinder, my Q enclosed is Q little r over big R over epsilon naught, and that is equal to 2 pi R L. Let's see. I think I should not have. Okay. Yes. That gives me units of charge. And my electric field is going to have a dependence on R or on L because how much charge is enclosed depends on how long the cylinder is. All right, so this gives me the form for my radial dependence of the charge. I can do some cancellations. I have an R here and an R here. So my electric field as a function of radius is going to be constant. Q over epsilon naught R times 2 pi epsilon naught r over the length. Outside of the sphere, or sorry, outside of the cylinder, my Q enclosed is simply Q so I have, let's see, I have Q over epsilon naught and 
this is equal to the electric field outside of the sphere of the cylinder times two pi little r l. So the electric field from the outside of the cylinder is equal to q over two pi r l epsilon naught. Now, how this L dependence is often dealt with is that you are given the charge density per unit length. And you can see here that when you are exactly at the radius of the cylinder R, this, the, the field inside has to equal the field outside. Okay, so the only thing that was different here is that we um, integrated over a cylinder instead of a sphere. But the basic principle was the same. You're always integrating over the surface area. Um, now, if you had a, um, you could in principle have some electric field perpendicular to the cylinder. Um, and then that could contribute as well. But if you let the, if you let the electric field enclose, so you could, without changing the flux, you could have some constant field going through here. Um, but if you had any contribution perpendicular to the cylinder, you would ruin your, um, your symmetry. All right. So then, um, and this just shows what we just did. This shows that you can, in fact, have, um, so if you have this radially symmetric field, you can get um, your area, your normal vector is perpendicular to a radially symmetric field. So, yeah, this is showing the, sur the area we integrated over when we were outside of the sphere that had charge. And this is showing what it looks like when we integrate over, so now we're integrating over a cylindrical shell. We can also use, do integrals over planes. So now we're going to reconsider the, the plane charge. Now you have, um, so now you have a plane charge. The components of the electric field parallel to a plane of charges has to cancel out um, so you've got two charges on a plane, um, and there's some symmetry. Um, because you have uniform, uh, a uniform distribution of charges, you actually have a weird form of symmetry. You have translational symmetry. So wherever you move on the chart on the infinite plane, it always looks the same. So then you have to have a net electric field perpendicular to the field. So you can actually then, or perpendicular to the plane. So if you have a case like this, you can draw a box. So we're going to go ahead and draw a box. We'll use this box. And now you have an electric field, which is, we'll just put it in the positive z direction. Um, uh, and it's, there's got to be another, sorry, up here it's in the positive z direction. There's another side of symmetry here, which is that this is, if you flip the sign of z, you get the, so you flip your coordinate system, you have to also get the same answer that you got before. Um, because the choice of whether to put z positive and up or down is completely and totally arbitrary. So you can't have the field point up here, and then you can't have the field point away from the plane here and toward the plane down there. So. Then, if we do our integral, we're going to draw a box, which is of length L and with W. So our electric, and then we have a um, charge density sigma. So the flux is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. We are going to choose okay. 
we're going to, oh, and then let me write the height is h, but the height does not change the, that will change the, um, the sides, uh, the area enclosed by the sides, but not by the top and the bottom. So when we do the electric field dotted with the normal vector, the only two cases when this is non-zero are when you are, are on the top side of the cube. Well, I said cube. It's actually a rectangular box. So the top or the bottom. If we have a uniform uh, area charge so that there's some charge density per unit area, when we draw this box, the Q enclosed is going to be the charge density per unit area times the length times the width. So that's our epsilon naught. And then our electric field is going to be the, our, the electric flux is E dot n hat A. In both cases, E dot n hat is just the magnitude of the electric field. So this is going to be the magnitude of the electric field times the area, which is length times width. And then we have a box on, the, we have a side on the top and a side on the bottom that both have the same electric field and the same area. So we get a factor of two. Then we get some cancellation. And we can calculate that the electric field from a plane charge is equal to the charge density per unit area over 2 epsilon naught. It's a nice, neat problem. Now, if you did this with the uh, by using the definition of uh, a, a, the the definition of the electric field from a point charge and then integrated over the whole surface. It would be a lot uglier problem. Let me see if I can't just set that up for you so you could see how much uglier that is. In that case, the electric field is equal, ooh, ooh this is scary. The electric field is Q, it, let's leave it as, let's do four pi epsilon naught, and then R squared, and then R hat, we have to consider if we are, we'll just consider what the electric field is at the origin because we're going to look at an infinite plane and it's going to be the same everywhere as it is for the origin and we need something neat enough to calculate this r hat. So r hat um, is going to be x, x hat, plus y, y hat, plus z, z hat, divided by the length of that vector. And this is true for the, the r hat pointing towards the origin anywhere. All right, so then, uh, uh, do I want to do it this way? Um, this is why this is such a tricky problem. Then, ah, uh, yes I do, because I want to leave only the Z coordinate. I'm going to only consider the Z coordinate, uh, because the X and the Y coordinates are going to cancel out. I'm going to integrate over the whole plane, and then um, I have... I have to consider r, my r squared is going to be this, uh, sorry, r squared is going to, not the square root, so only my, so my dq, I now need dq, that is going to be 
the surface density dx dy and my z component of the electric field is going to be sigma z z hat over x squared plus y squared plus z squared all to the 3 halves and then I integrate from negative infinity to infinity because I'm integrating over the entire plane. This is how I would have to calculate the electric field for a plane charge if I were to start with Coulomb's law. That's pretty ugly. It's doable. Uh, oh, and I forgot my dx and my dy. I could look it up in an integral table. It's gonna have uh, it's gonna have terms of the inverse tangent, and then you're gonna take the limit of the inverse tangent as the um, as x and y go to infinity. It gets ugly fast. It's much nicer to use Gauss's law. It's a little trickier to set up because you have to think about you have to think a little bit more about the physics of the situation when you're using Gauss's law because you have to make sure you have to make sure that you know how much charge you're enclosing you have to make sure that you understand the symmetries in the problem but then it rapidly reduces to an algebraic problem whereas if you use Coulomb's law it really is a test to see how well you can do ugly integrals all right now let's move on to metals and what is a metal how is this relevant um, when you have a metal, you can think about electrons and inside of that metal is being more or less free to slosh around and go wherever they want to. Um, and they're always going to choose to go. Systems tend to go to the lowest energy state. So it takes energy to have charges near each other. If you have a metal, you, are, you can approximate what goes on in the metal at, a, at the microscopic level as um, rearranging the charges so that you have no net electric field inside of that charge. We call this shielding because inside of the metal, the electrons, and the electrons are basically going to move around so that the charge is distributed so that there is no net electric field inside of that charge. So here, if you have a charge near a metal sphere, um, the, there's going to be a surface charge. You have positive charge here. There's going to be a surface charge here that, um, that shields the inside of the conductor from the charge so there's no electric field. And then to compensate, there's going to be a, a positive surface charge on this side so that if you are actually outside the sphere over here, you would be able to tell that there was a positive charge in, on that side. Um, and when you remove the charge, the polarization disappears because if you did not have this charge right here, then you, you would have, if you had this configuration of charges, you would in fact have an electric field inside the metal. So you can think of this as analogous to water moving around um, in, some, in a pond. The water is going to rearrange itself until it is flat, until it is in the lowest configuration, uh, lowest energy configuration. It takes energy to have charges to have some sort of electric field. It's gonna it's gonna settle so that the the potential is is constant. Yeah. So this is just showing what's happening. If you have uh, if you have some external charges, the surface area is going to the surface the charge is going to rearrange itself on the surface so that. The, there is no net electric field inside of the sphere itself. So if you take, if you have a little tiny hole in a conductor, you take some um, positive charge and you uh, positively charge probe, it's going to, um, the, the, the conductor is going to rearrange charges to shield the rest of the metal from this positive charge. 
If you then touch the inside of the cavity, you get the electrons that are surrounding this to move up on your probe. Then you have removed electrons. Um, and the surface of, so all the positive charge is going to be redistributed to the surface here to enable the conduct conductor to have no net electric field inside of the metal itself. Um, so here, this is showing if you, if you are on the very surface of the conductor. Um, now, obviously, uh, at some point, you're dealing with physically si physical objects, and they're really atoms and molecules on the surface of the metal. Oh, they're really, on a metal, they're really atoms. Um, so you might not be able, there is some distribution of the charge, but um, we're not, when we're looking at very large scales, we're not sensitive to that. So you, you can think of it as the charge being distributed exactly on the surface. And then when you do um, some surface integral over that, ex whenever you are inside of the surface, the electric field is zero. Just outside of it, the electric field, this is now spherically symmetric. You have to have the electric field um, because it's spherically symmetric because you're everywhere you look, you're close to the, it looks like the surface is infinite. So your electric field is going to per point perpendicular to the surface because if you're actually on that surface, it looks like it extends forever. Um, and so if you had any component in this direction, that would break that symmetry. Um, and so you're, and then you draw your box, you have some surface charge. You can calculate, you could use Gauss's law to calculate what that field is, but it's always going to point, point perpendicular to the surface. All right, so here you can see a side view, um, and this is showing the surface of the metal, or is surface of an infinite conducting plate, and you're just integrating over the, the bare edge of the surface. All right, so and this is so now we can talk about what that does. We already touched on this a little bit. So when you have some spherically symmetric, uh, so when you have a sorry, when you have a when you have a conducting sphere, now we had figured out that for a spherically symmetric um, a spherically symmetric problem your flux is equal to Q and close over epsilon naught, which is equal to the electric field times the area, and the area is four pi times the radius that you integrate over squared. Now, if you have a conducting sphere here, your electric field inside here has to be zero. That means no charge is enclosed. That means that all of the charge has to be on the surface of the sphere um, simply because the electric, the electric field goes to zero. So the charges are going to arrange themselves on the outside of the sphere. You can then come up with different, and, and we have them in the examples in the homework, different configurations where you have a conductor so you know that the electric field is zero, or you have some different distribution of charges. Um, there's a bunch of different permutations of how you can arrange the, um, how, you can ar how you can set up spherically symmetric problems so that it is actually solvable and you can tell me what the electric field is. All right, so if you have a positively charged electric sphere, inside, metal sphere, inside the, the um, Inside the sphere, the electric field is zero. Outside, it is constant. And then, because it is a spherically symmetric problem, then outside of the sphere, the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared times the charge enclosed. And it is pointing out from the charge. So if you have a charge enclosed inside of a conducting sphere, Outside of the sphere, you cannot tell that you, uh, you cannot tell 
the difference between that charge being isotropically distributed or all on the surface. But if you have a conducting sphere, the charge actually sits on the surface. If you have a metal with some type of cavity, because it rearranges itself so that the net electric field is zero, um, what it's going to do is that it's going to shield the metal, um, shield the rest of the metal um, by arranging charges right around that um, right around that cavity with a charge. And then on the outside of the metal, it's going to re rearrange the positive charges. So this part of the metal does not see the, does not even see this charge. So on the outside, there's got to be you've taken ch negative charges and bumped them, lumped them in here. So outside of the metal, um, so here it's not a, the rest of the metal is unaware of what's going on inside this cavity because the electric field is zero everywhere. So when you are out here, it's going to be isotropically distributed charges. And then here, if you have a, if you have a cavity and you have no net charge, on, no charge on the inside of the cavity because the electric field is zero inside the metal, the, um, the charges are going to arrange themselves so that um, the electric field is zero inside the cavity. You cannot tell that there is a charge there. This shielding actually is really important, um, and you've probably already experienced it. Um, so if you've ever taken an elevator while talking on the cell phone on a cell phone and your call dropped, that's because of this effect. This effect is called a Faraday cage, that if you have some something covered in a metal, uh, you cannot get, or at least it's very difficult to get, an electric field to penetrate a metal because the, um, the metal will rearrange its electrons so that the net, char the net electric field is zero. Um, if you are, and of course, the, um, your phone uh, signal is transmitted through electromagnetic waves, which means that when you are inside, which means that it's transmitted at least part of the time by a changing electric field. And there's also a changing magnetic field that's a little harder to shield than, a mag than an electric field. But the, when you're in an elevator, then the, as the electric field from your cell phone signal goes through this, the walls of the elevator, the electrons in the, um, the, electrons in the metal in the elevator are going to rearrange themselves to try to keep that electric field zero. In other words, killing your, the signal for your cell phone. Now, this approximation that the electric field is zero has, uh, has some limits. It does take some time to rearrange the, the charges that way. Um, and, you know, it can't, if you get a strong enough field, it can still leak through. Um, and when you talk about a cell phone signal, the frequency is very fast. Um, so the, the metal doesn't always have, cannot always respond fast enough to keep it completely shielded. But at the very least, it does actually significantly reduce the amplitude of, the, of your cell phone signal inside of the elevator. That's also why if you are inside a concrete building, you often cannot get a good cell phone signal or in the old days, a TV signal, because inside the walls of concrete buildings, they are reinforced with uh, iron rebar. Now that's not a solid metal cover, but the iron itself can also act as a Faraday cage, which keeps, keeps electromagnetic signals from penetrating concrete buildings well. All right, so um, here, if you, have, uh, um, if you have two charges um, in different cavities, you can end up getting a net charge on, so the net charge on the cavity is, um, is non and the cavities is non-zero. Um, then the surface, so the charges are going to rearrange themselves around the surface. Um, but there will be no charge induced outside if this charge is exactly equal um, to that charge. All right. And with that, we're going to end our chapter on Gauss's law, and we'll see you guys next time.